It's a great pleasure to be here at this uh, first kidney cancer patient education conference of KCC. So I wanted to put this uh, brief presentation in the context of survivorship, uh, which is a term that is being increasingly used to capture this phase of uh, cancer care that occurs after what Dr. Kapoor so eloquently described uh, before. And the, the term uh, cancer survivor, I know it's a controversial term. Some people actually prefer to be called patients, but it's increasingly since a report from the U.S. National Cancer Institute about five years ago is being applied to any individual who uh, from the time of diagnosis, not simply from treatment, through the balance of his or her life. And it embraces their caregivers, family members, friends, uh, who are impacted in any way by that experience. So this is the domain we're speaking about. And within this is how do the nurses and doctors organize follow-up for the given disease and the treatment and driven by the extent of the uh, of the treatment and this report which this video was uh, built around that appeared about five years ago has become the touchstone for this whole field of survivorship and we're currently talking about having a survivorship focused meeting in Canada sometime in the next year where we'll try to bring together the uh, survivors and the caregivers and the professionals who are involved in the urinary tract cancers because many of the institutions and the physicians, nurses are the same people that look after prostate, bladder and kidney cancer, although there are some specifics about each, uh, to see if we couldn't make some suggestions to improve this whole Canadian survivorship experience. We know that presently the, the definitive cure for kidney cancer is surgery. There are lots of other therapies, uh, but this has been and remains the standard of care. And it really was codified here in Toronto by my teacher, Charles Robson, whose picture is here, uh, starting uh, decades ago and culminating in the definitive report that's now 40 years old that really taught us what the important principles were of kidney cancer surgery, which, as you heard from Dr. Kapoor, has moved dramatically from the removal of the whole kidney through a big incision uh, to less and less invasive and hopefully in the future totally extracorporeal non-invasive therapies. And the objective here is to remove the tumor. So, so then what do we do? Well, most of the follow-up is based on the extent of the cancer, and these cartoons capture the uh, various stages which we've already heard about. The majority now of Canadian kidney cancers are in this category to your left of the very small tumors which are picked up incidentally and which are stage one tumors and as they grow we move through increasingly higher stages and we increasingly face risks of recurrence of those cancers if there is none uh, detected at the time of initial treatment. Fortunately the minority of patients present with advanced disease, either a big local tumor, which we've just heard a, a case of very eloquently, uh, or spread of the cancer, but that's what we're mainly concerned about. So the urologists in Canada sat down a few years ago and put together guidelines that would allow us to standardize the way we follow patients based on the risk of recurrence and I'm going to briefly present this, but I want to put it in the context of uh, how we see the purpose of this kind of follow-up. And Wes Kasouf, whose first name is on this list and is at McGill, uh, led this initiative and uh, allowed me to use some of his slides uh, in my presentation. I'm very grateful to Wes for doing that. You may know him as a uro-oncologist at McGill University in the Montreal General Hospital. So this is what this group produced, and this is a table, and down the left-hand column is the uh, different 
stages of cancer at the time of surgery. So each one of these categories, uh, pathologically, this turned out to be a tumor that was uh, four centimeters or less, and that's a T1 tumor. And then at intervals following the surgery, I'm sorry, this mouse is, is a little slow to come up here, but at intervals of months, three, six, 12 months after surgery, the proposal is to do testing, for example, here, a history and physical exam in the clinic, blood work and a chest x-ray at 12 months, not before, and then at 24 months, whereas in a more advanced tumor here, it would be at six months and it would involve a CT scan. So a spectrum and rather complex, but this framework is what the best evidence could uh, support. And why would we recommend doing this? Well, initially, when we treat patients, we bring them back, and you, many of you have been in this situation, to be sure there are no complications of that treatment, to support the recovery phase from taking out stitches through to uh, the healing of the wound. Uh, we are very concerned about kidney function after kidney surgery. We know that people that develop kidney cancer have a significantly greater risk of having chronic kidney diseases than people who don't get kidney cancer. And we know that, for example, by following up patients who've donated a kidney for transplant compared to those who've lost a kidney for cancer. And those two populations have different outcomes. If we leave the cancer out of the equation, the people who have had kidney cancer as the reason they've lost a kidney have a much higher rate of getting chronic uh, cardiac and vascular diseases and kidney failure than the other population who are not at apparently an increased risk. And this has led us to, to do things like Dr. Uh, Kapoor showed us of partial kidney removals as opposed to a complete kidney removal. So it's very important that we monitor that. And we're increasingly aware of this. It's only really been in the last four or five years that we've understood the significance of losing a kidney for kidney cancer in terms of the remaining kidney function. And then lastly, the thing that you probably would be most concerned about is can we detect a recurrence early, either where the kidney was, where the tumor was in the kidney, or because we know there's a risk of up to 10% of getting a tumor in the other kidney or elsewhere in that same kidney looking for a new tumor, and then, of course, if it has spread. And the reason that we don't know that always at the beginning is that we have no way of detecting microscopic cancer cells. They don't expand the lymph glands. They don't create a spot on a chest X-ray big enough to see, and we need millions, actually, of cancer cells in one of those sites to deform the normal tissue enough to create that spot or change that will allow us to pick it up. And it isn't that the, the kidney cancer has come back when it's detected at three years or even longer. It is those cells have been growing slowly and are now large enough that we can pick it up on the uh, testing. So uh, the kidney function part, uh, we, we monitor mainly through a blood test called creatinine here in the second bullet, and we monitor uh, blood tests, uh, the hemoglobin as well, and we go on and do this at intervals. So we, we felt that based on the evidence we now have that this could be recommended for our patients with a fair degree of confidence, and we apply a grade of evidence to that, that this is a worthwhile thing to do based on the evidence that we have in the literature. So this recurrence of cancer is increased, the risk is increased, if the surgical margin that Dr. Kapoor was discussing where he cut through that upper part of the right kidney and took out that small tumor, if that cut was close to the tumor and there was actually tumor on that surface, then we'd be concerned that there might be a recurrence in that part of the kidney. And we know that if that's a very malignant tumor under the microscope, it's a high-grade tumor, that risk would go up. Uh, we know that tumors can occur in other parts of the kidney. Um, we f believe that if we can detect that tumor early in recurrent states, then we'll have a better chance of treating it. And if we 
uh, I'm just a little concerned about time here, so I'm, I'm maybe just going to, to uh, pass through this a little bit, that we felt as urologists in Canada that we could support surveillance for recurrence, and that may seem like an odd thing to you, wouldn't it be intuitive that we do that? Well, there are different tumor sites in the body where follow-up carefully performed in a cancer center versus discharging the patient back to their family doctor for routine follow-up once every year or two, that the actual ultimate survival from that cancer didn't change. So it led us in the last 10, 15 years to reflect on whether this effort that we're making, whether this anxiety we're putting our patients through of bringing them back repeatedly to the clinics is actually justifiable and, and of course the cost involved. But it was the considered opinion of this Canadian group of uh, individuals who are considered to be experts in kidney cancer that if we could detect cancer earlier in this situation, we would potentially influence the outcome positively. This has not actually been tested. There has not been a randomized trial. As Dr. Knox is going to tell you this afternoon, this concept of clinical trials where we test something against another agent or another strategy, we have yet in kidney cancer to discharge half our patients into the community to their routine care and keep half of them going through a system of follow-up like I showed you earlier. That's, that's not an easy trial to do, but given what we know about kidney cancer, we feel it is justifiable to follow up patients closely. So can we stratify patients by risk of recurrence? And the answer is yes, we can. You saw that slide from Dr. Kapoor of the different kinds of kidney cancer. This renal cell carcinoma is not one disease, it's uh, several, and they behave differently. Some cancers are higher grade, more malignant, more likely to spread. If a tumor is large, that is a higher stage, more likely to recur. And of course, if there is spread already, that is a very different situation than if the patient doesn't have any evidence of spread. So there are some types which very clearly have a high, high risk, and those were at the bottom of Dr. Kapoor's slide, uh, particularly these collecting duct carcinomas and if there's sarcomatoid elements in the tumor. And conversely, papillary and chromophobes seem to be uh, less likely to spread. We know that individual patients, when they have spread of cancer, if they're feeling sick versus feeling well, predicts for how well they're going to do with or without further treatments. If they have pain in their tumor when they present versus not, seems to predict for uh, different outcomes, etc. cetera. Uh, so what we did was look at the publications out there on uh, treatment of kidney cancer and looked at how patients recurred, how it was picked up, when it happened, and from that structure, we're able to uh, codify, if you will, how these tests should be optimally applied. And wherever there's variation in any system, whether it's making an automobile or looking after patients in clinics, if between days the same type of patients manage differently, or if between clinics there's different ways, we know that there is not clear evidence of what's best, and we know we're likely increasing the costs and uncertainties of healthcare. So we more and more are trying to standardize and create standard operating procedures, which is a term from industry, in how we do things, and we try to assess that after a period of time to see if it is doing what we think it would do. And that's a, a reason to have a guideline, which is what uh, we've done in the follow-up of uh, kidney cancer. And we don't have good trials that we can look at to, to uh, achieve that consensus. Whenever we look at literature, we establish from that a level of evidence or confidence, and this is a very uh, long sl slide, but basically if we have a randomized clinical trial 
where we treated patients with a pink pill versus a blue pill, we hope we'll know which pill is better, and that would be a very high level of evidence. If, on the other hand, I was to say, Mr. Smith, I think you'll do better if we do this, because in my experience, this is better than that, that would be considered a relatively low level of evidence in terms of, of, of uh, scientific justification. It may be correct, but the evidence isn't as strong. So a number of models have been built in kidney cancer, and I won't uh, go through all of these in the interest of time, but by stratifying patients by various characteristics, the stage, extent of the tumor, whether they had lymph gland involvement, uh, how big the tumor was, um, the grade under the microscope, etc., and putting these factors together, we can take groups of patients who have varying numbers of these adverse characteristics and look at time and that top right-hand box is a, a table where you can see multiple lines over time and the groups of patients who, for example, had eight or more of these um, factors did much poorer. In other words, their, their survival without cancer recurring uh, was much lower over time and here by five years, 90% of the patients had had a recurrence of their cancer. So this is a way that we might take you, Mr. Smith, and say you have an 80% chance of doing fine, but the flip side is you have a 20% chance that it's going to come back. And how are we going to detect that and uh, what are we going to do about it? Are you prepared, and thinking of Dr. Buckman's presentation this morning, is that going to produce a lot of anxiety or little anxiety? And of course, if we can do something about it when it comes back, that's going to make a big difference. So there are a variety of predictive models, and I won't bore you with all the details, uh, but based on all of these models, uh, we felt that in Canada we should focus on the stage of the cancer as opposed to looking at the uh, other uh, factors for practical purposes out in the in the community and uh, we don't have good single center data in Canada we have some but we don't have huge um, numbers so we're we have decided to use the pathological stage and I'm just going to um, pop ahead to this table again which now makes a little more sense to you I hope that after your surgery, you will see your pathology report or it will be explained to you that your tumor was, for example, six centimeters in diameter. So that makes you a T2 tumor and it's pathologically T2 because this is the measurement in the uh, surgery and in the, the pathology lab. And we would recommend that you be seen six months after your surgery and you be examined, you tell us how you feel, and we do a creatinine blood test, we do a blood count, and we would actually measure your liver function test because that's a, an estimate also of whether the cancers come back we'd recommend that you have a chest x-ray and then we'd see you at 12 months and we would do the same plus we would do a CT scan. So we're in the process of validating this uh, schema. We're using this uh, as best we can in the clinics uh, at the Princess Margaret Hospital and I believe the other hospitals and we hope that in the next few years we can pool our experience and from that say okay we should have done this earlier or later or not at all and possibly improve detection and possibly reduce the expense and inconvenience to you as the patients because we know it's easy to ignore your cancer for five months but in that weeks and day particularly before coming back to see us in the clinic uh, that's not an easy time to cope with. We don't have such good follow-up protocols for these what I call focal or probablation therapies, which Dr. Kapoor has talked to you about, uh, because in this case we've also got to follow the tumor, because the tumor's not been removed. So there are a variety of follow-up protocols using MRI, CT at various intervals that are more intense at the beginning because we want to see that mass disappear. That means the kidney uh, tumor, we hope, has been eradicated, and then less frequent follow-up over time. And that's an additional component to what we talked about earlier here with when we take out the tumor. Uh, we don't have 
good guidelines at the present time, and I, I joke with uh, Dr. Knox and Dr. McKenzie and Dr. Bjarnson about this, that we have very good protocols for after surgery, but in fairness, it's, I think, easier to develop those protocols. But what to do when a patient has metastatic disease and gets, for example, a targeted therapy, how often should they have a CT scan or some other imaging and blood work to follow that up? And uh, this is, I would say, work in progress. So to finish up, there, there are some significant outstanding questions beyond whether we should be doing the follow-up, which we currently believe we should. What do we do after an interval of 10 years, maybe even earlier? Do we need to continue that follow-up? I've already alluded to the ablation, what we're doing. Uh, we don't have a good handle on the total cost of this. We're embarking on a re-engineering project at Princess Margaret in our ambulatory care to see whether we can be a little more efficient with our follow-up, standardize it, try and measure the cost because we think this is a big part of cancer care uh, follow-up, uh, a total cost that we could probably uh, reduce. And not least, these imagings that we're doing, we're exposing you to uh, radiation, diagnostic radiation, albeit reducing that amount as we go along with improved technologies. And in patients that are over age 30, the risks are probably lower of getting complications in their lifetime, but nevertheless, it's a concern to us as I know it is to you. Uh, that's where we stand with the concepts behind follow-up and our proposed standardized system for the surgical follow-up. Thank you. Thank you.